Uh, we're going to start out easy. Um, I'd like you both to tell me a little bit about your inspiration for the book. Uh, and Lesia, I'd like to start with you. Great. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. So I was on a Lee and Lowe sponsored panel with Maya and Kyle Lukoff. And I learned so much from the two of them that that is really the inspiration for the book. But while I was writing, I, I had a couple of uh, questions in mind. One, which I think about all the time is, if you had nothing to conform to and nothing to rebel against, who would you be? Hmm. And I think about that a lot. Um, because when I was growing up, there were so many rigid expectations placed upon me. Um, there was just one way for a girl to be. And there was just no deviating from that. And it took me a long time to realize that that is not the truth about the world. Um, and then I love this quote by Oscar Wilde, which is be yourself, everyone else is taken. I, I just love that. And then this is a little hokey, but I once um, got a card that said uh, something like God created the world and looked around and decided that something was missing and that something was you. And I thought that was really interesting to think that the whole world, which is so varied and beautiful, still needs each one of us to be our true authentic selves to make the world complete. So those are the kind of things I was thinking of when I wrote the book. Yeah. Maya, how about you? Tell me a little bit about your inspiration. <clears throat> well, um, I think one of the big things when I, I got the, the beautiful words from Leslie and I started looking at them is it felt really in, in alignment with a lot of the other work that I do. Mm -hmm. And all of that really is sourced, I think, from being part of the community, having a trans partner, having a non-binary kid who's nine. So going through all of that stuff right now. And so really trying to attend to what would be the most healing, the most supportive, the most reflective, the most playful, right? The most um, expansive, sort of really taking the opportunity to break down as many um, expectations, assumptions around, you know, like what boys and girls are supposed to be. Um, so I think that was it, it was just like, oh, this is this great time to just kind of, um, it, it was the first time actually with a traditional press that I ever sort of like expressed that out. And so that was nice. I have, um, you know, Call Me Tree was sort of that tickling that a little bit with that. Um, and so it was a way to kind of continue that conversation and to expand on it, I think. And I, I think one of the most important things, especially for littles, is to create a safe space that they could enter into. And so that's really what I thought. I was like, there's this golden gateway, this pink forest, you know, this play area where kids literally can explore anything and everything without a lot of pressure, um, without any pressure, actually full support, so. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, so, Leslie, you've written so many books, <laughs> and I'm wondering what you've noticed um, in the course of your time as an active writer. What has changed in the field from when you started to now? So, my first book for kids was Heather Has Two Mommies, which came out in 1989. So, that's a long time ago, right? More than 30 years ago. And that book was co published. A friend and I raised the money on our own because nobody would touch a book like that back then. So obviously that has changed, right? There are many books that show two mom families, two dad families, um, gender creative kids, trans kids. So that's all great. Um, what hasn't changed, I know you didn't ask that, but um, <laughs> is that um, there are, I mean, many people have embraced these books and are so grateful for these books. And I get a lot of letters from um, parents, from educators who are, are so happy that these books exist. Um, and unfortunately, there are also many people who do not want these books to exist and go to great lengths to try and stop them from being available to the public. So that, that in fact, hasn't changed. In fact, it's escalated, but I think we're going to get to that later. But I do think that there are more and more opportunities for creators to write these kind of books and get them out in the world, which is which is really wonderful. Yeah, I agree. I, I've enjoyed watching that happen over the last several years, too. I haven't been in, in this field for as long uh, as some others, but it's definitely something I've noticed as well. And it's definitely um, very encouraging and empowering. 
Um, so Maya, uh, you touch on this a little bit in the intro to your, to the book, but I'd like if you could discuss your approach for the artwork a little bit and specifically what details you felt strongly you needed to include in the picture. Well, it's so interesting to think about that because while I was creating the book, of course, I was having tons and tons of thoughts. And I think one of the things besides creating the sense of a safe space that kids could literally enter, um, it was also a feeling of, of innocence and kids being able to just, we don't get a lot of imagery, even though it's changing quite a bit right now, we don't get a lot of non-binary imagery and we don't get a lot of fluid imagery of kids. And what does that mean? It really means being able to see a child, like we were saying before, like really explore and press into as many ways as they feel are authentic and genuine to them. And so I think that when I was thinking about it and looking at the couplets and like having the, the text there and something so um, fun to kind of press into, just like continuing to see how I could stretch that and expand our perception so that every time we think we follow a kid, we think we know something, there's something that, you know, changes in the next spread. Yeah. Um, I really like how uh, you used color in the spread. Like there was one, one spread that was just like predominantly purple and all the kids were wearing purple and the backgrounds were purple. And I really liked how uh, you, you sort of made everything feel very cohesive, that, that sense of exploration in each scene. I found that very very nice to read. Oh, good. <laughs> My job is working. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so uh, in both the art and in the pictures, um, I notice like an overabundance of playfulness and bounciness. And um, I would like you both to talk a little bit about why open and undirected play is so important for children, especially the typical picture book audience age. Um, Maya, why don't we start with you? Well, I keep singing the gender song it seems i think there's something about um having a sense of i know we keep hearing that word safety come up quite a bit too sort of a safe space to sort of play when we have so many gender expectations and a lot of times especially as educators as parents as caregivers we don't even know what we're communicating we don't know how many like little gendered things are in there. It could even be in the way that we hold our body. So much of it is nonverbal, right? And so I wanted to really provide that like, a set, well, this is in all my work, that sense of exuberance of just like, you know, I get to just like, I don't have to think about restriction right now. I can literally expand into my body, into the space, into my spirit, really into that deeper part of ourself. And so that's, I think that playfulness for me is just like, a sense of safety and like you can do anything that you hear from within. Hmm. Leslie, how about you? Tell me about play. Well, you know, I just want to live in this book. <laughs> I mean, there's just, just, there's so much fun to that. And, you know, I, I don't want to come up with someone who had a terrible childhood because I did not, but I did have this childhood that was so rigid in gender expectations, you know, to the point, not only, you know, I was supposed to play with dolls. I hated dolls. I was supposed to read Nancy Jew. My, my brother read the Hardy Boys. I mean, just everything, every, what we read, what we wore, what we played with and what we felt. I mean, it was okay for me to cry, but it wasn't okay for my brother to cry, right? It was okay for my brother to get angry. It wasn't okay for me to get angry. So really my purpose in creating children's literature is to allow kids to be free to discover whoever they are and to really not think about expectations, but just like have this, this sense of wonder and discovery that the whole world is open to them and they can take their place in it with joy and without feeling they're going to upset someone or disappoint someone or anger someone. They're just being themselves. It's about them. Yeah, I also think um, I, I have a three-year-old, so I sort of watch this happen every day. But um, in in playing, you're doing experiments, and you're learning about yourself, and you're learning about how you feel, and being able to do that in an unrestricted way um, feels very empowering to me. And in a lot of ways, I often feel like hands off as a parent, like letting her do what she needs to do and play how she wants to play, and um, I. 
I keep thinking about how I'm letting her learn on her own. And that kind of autonomy for a child has to be important, even if they don't realize it yet. I mean, Leslie, you're talking about how there were so many expectations placed on you as a child. You still think about that now. Um, and I think giving, giving children, especially this age group, an opportunity to just take themselves where they wanna go um, feels very important to me. And what if that time lasted your whole life? <laughs> I think that it does for yeah. some. Yeah. yeah. It did for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> That's something that, uh, oh, I hadn't really thought about that. Isn't it funny how like being a parent makes you reevaluate your entire existence? <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, uh, this is obviously a work of collaboration. Um, and I'm curious, Leslie, what is your favorite thing about Maya's art? And Maya, I'm going to ask you a vice versa in a second here. Wow, it's really hard to pick one favorite thing because there's so, so much in, in these illustrations. I love the joy, the energy, the feeling of cooperation and affection and support between the children and even the animals. Um, I love that every time I open this book, I see something new that I didn't discover before. Uh, just today, I realized that one of the children is wearing a top that has a dinosaur on it. And I didn't notice that before. And, I, and I've looked at this book, you know, countless times. So there's just so much to take in and explore and delight in. So I would say what I like best about it pretty much is everything. <laughs> Thank you, darling. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Uh, now, Which is a, I was going to say, this is a, a great segue because just like right off the bat, I have to say that I hate to be, you know, old school, but I am, is that Heather Has Two Mommies like changed everything and, and opened up a door, I think, for all of us. And that coupled with the first book I illustrated was a book for Gloria Ansel Duo, it was a Chicanx, you know, lesbian voice showing a non-binary child, like it, it literally changed me and it changed what I thought was possible in the world. And, and even who I thought I could be and, and what we could do in the world. And as a queer, I think that that's really rare. I mean, it's starting to be like, there's more support for that now, but to, to just pause for a moment and just be like, to, to say like, we're standing on shoulders that are Leslie's right now. <laughs> That's really keen. <laughs> you good girl, you got it. <laughs> um, and then again, I just want to say, call out again, I, I mentioned it in the illustrator's note, is that Leslie's um, text is so solid, so strong, so, and that's really tricky to do. Uh, having read a couple of children's books, like when you like pare it down to that essence and you get it to that place and having something so strong and so powerful like that to literally play freely within um, was a great experience. So it was this like reverberating experience for me where I was just like in the moment, but also in the past and the future at the same time. And so you kind of tripped me out, Leslie, with that presence. And that was really nice because so much of creating a book in collaboration, right, is it's more of a spiritual process. It's that unspoken, it's all those, you know, connections that are inside of history and our hearts. So that was, I hope that conveys <laughs> something about the experience. Can I just add one thing? So, mm -hmm. so I am still uh, continuously learning from Maya. She really helped me with some of the text. Um, right at the, kind of the eleventh hour of the book, the the opening was um, "I can be anyone I want to be," and Maya so smartly pointed out anyone why should the child be anyone but themselves so we changed it to i can do anything i well let me just i have to get get the right line so instead of i can be i can be everything i want to be which is so much stronger and so much more open and so much more validating so i just want to thank maya for pointing that out to me instead of i can be anyone i can be everything you hear that difference it's huge difference and um so i continue to learn and that's why i love working in collaboration that's lovely um so uh, 
often in the kid lit world, we talk about what children take away from picture books, but so often adults are reading picture books to children. And I'm very curious about what you hope adult readers are going to take away from this. Um, Maya, can we start with you on this one? Sure. Um, I'm going to sneak a little thing in there, actually, um, because I often think I pray into the children as I'm creating the books, but I'm keeping the grown-ups in mind the whole time because that's who's holding the space, right? And the more confident, the more solid we can get the grown-ups, uh, the more that nonverbal, right, that deeper message of, of belonging and, and freeness can be communicated. So um, one of the things is I encourage people to, the grownups to follow a character through the book or follow all the, take a moment, but take time with each one and, and see what assumptions come up for you. And just allow yourself to press into those assumptions that we make, because these are those things that we are communicating non-verbally around gender. And so you can just kind of take it, it's a gentle journey for yourself um, to just be like, oh, oops, I totally thought this kid would have been assigned female. And now I notice this. Oh, I'm assuming this one would have been, so I think all these ones are female and all these would have been assigned male. Oh, I can open my mind even further, right? And so allow ourselves to experience what a lot of gender fluid kids experience out in the world, these kind of assumptions pressing on them, this kind of stuff getting projected onto them all the time. And then you can learn to take some of yours off. That's, I think, the the hidden message, not so hidden, hidden, <laughs> that I, I wanted the book to hold. Leslie, how about you? So one thing that um, was purposefully done was that the only pronoun in the book is I. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage if adults are reading this book to a group of children to be really careful that you don't put other pronouns in here when referring to the characters, unless you want to say they, of course, but you know, not to look at this character and say, oh, he has his hand on the dog. Well, how do you know that that's the, the correct pronoun? So, so to really think about that. And once you start thinking about that, and practicing that with a book, you can go out into the world and practice that as well, which I think is really important. Uh, that's making me think of what you said earlier, Maya, about um, creating a safe space in the artwork. In, in the book, you're creating a safe space for adults to, to sort of dismantle their convictions about what gender looks like. Um, and in, in that small moment, you can examine how you're feeling about something and maybe it with a little bit of discomfort if you have it and it's just a picture book there's no state except your own discovery which is lovely mm. um so I, I feel like we have been kind of dancing around this issue with this conversation um but uh book censorship is obviously in the news particularly around stories featuring trans children or uh, non-binary children and certainly in uh around actual trans children um, and I'm wondering if there's something that you think is missing from the wider conversation we've been hearing about it, and if there's anything you want our listeners to know that you think maybe they are not aware of yet about um, this issue. Uh, Leslie, why don't you go first? On this one. Oh, this issue, you know, it just brings tears to my eyes because what I think people forget, maybe accidentally on purpose, maybe not, is that who really suffers are the children, right? You know, not having this type of book available to a child can really be harmful. And on the other hand, having a book like this, many books like these, as many books as possible uh, that really smash gender stereotypes and expectations can save children's lives. And that's what I think we have to keep coming back to. And that's why I keep writing books like this. And, you know, I think about, you know, frankly, my own personal safety, um, you know, it would be easier to do something else, but it's just too important to me because, you know, in, in my tradition, which is Judaism, is when you, they, we say, when you save a life, you save a world. And I really don't think I'm being overly dramatic when I say that a, a child who is exploring their identity and finds a book that really validates and supports them in doing that can really save their life. And so that is what I think is missing from the conversation and needs to be forefront in the conversation because it's not about the adults ultimately, it's about the kids, you know. Maya, how about you? 
goodness, goodness, it's been such an intense time these days. I think when I paused for a moment to really take this apart, I think the, one of the first things that came up for me um, was around you know, definitely echoing what, what Leslie is saying, but is also around free speech and how um, as a, a queer person with a trans partner and a non-binary child who's been an educator around gender for 12 years, you know, being able to address my community, which includes queer trans intersex kids, right, and support them and provide them with comfort, as well as information that has been historically suppressed around science, around nature, around bodies, around history, around everything, uh, including US history, indigenous history, um, that this kind of censorship really continues that suppression and our inability to bring forward comforting and new ideas around gender that are not part of the dominant narratives and how we can uh, continue to heal gender, not just define and address gender, to, but really uh, go into what's been happening here and begin to heal it. And so that's where I find we're not really addressing the larger context uh, the kind of suppression that has gone on. And I'm, I'm talking about like research and studies and science and medicine and psychology. And so that's where we're really, you know, taking a hit. And uh, I think that we're going to push through this time. But I think that remembering that larger context uh, around free speech and, and what we're denying uh, being kids being able to access, uh, I think is really important. Yeah. I, I think a lot about um, so much of what you were saying, Leslie, that children are, are what's at stake and children are what's being left out of the conversation is that uh, not just, uh, you know, autonomy and choice and freedom of exploration for trans children, but for all children, um, being able to freely explore your library as a child was, was something that I had the privilege of enjoying. Um, my parents let me run loose in the library and check out whatever I wanted to check out. And the librarians never stopped me, even when I found Switch Bitch as a third grader, when I was going through my role doll phase and read it and didn't understand it at all. Um, and that freedom is something that is being like systematically taken away from a lot of children. And I find that to be such a deep tragedy because that's, that's how you learn is by exploring and there squaring off the corners of where you're allowed to explore. And um, I I also hope that we will power through this time. And I'm curious if you if you are holding on to anything in particular that's helping you feel involved or engaged or hopeful about how we move through this time and these conversations and the legislation that's happening, it seems like on a weekly basis. Well, you know, I hold on to the children, you know, because they're, they're our hope and they're, you know, my experience with kids is that for the most part, they're so much more open-minded and, you know, I know a kid who, you know, yelled at his parents, you know, be, for using the incorrect pronouns about uh, their teddy bear. I mean, how great is that, right? Um, and just, you know, to, it's not a big deal to kids, you know? So I just like to to remember that and go back to that basic connection with children, which is why I do what I do. And, you know, the rest of it is just a comic opera. I mean, you know, it's serious it's, and it's harmful, but I really feel like if I can remember the reason that I am in this field doing the work that I do, that gives me the strength to keep speaking up. How about you? What do you hold on to? It's so funny. I'm, it's so challenging to even think of sometimes. I think I'm, I'm going to say I'm just going to call in nature at the moment. That so much of what I teach and what I rely on is the powerful, exuberant body, gender, and relationship diversity that is reflected in nature all around us, mm -hmm. and that I steep myself in through my work and and my kids, so that we're always feeling like we belong, and we're part of this grander mysterious, beautiful, valuable, necessary part of the flow of life and and how to how to craft my mind in a way to focus that way uh, 
at the same time as we're seeing all of this oppression try to press down on that balance, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I guess the other thing would be the kid lit community. You know, yeah. there are so many wonderful creators of children's literature who I could call upon, who, you know, if I'm going through something, if another attack is happening on one of my books, or or if I see that somebody else's books are being attacked, you know, I'll just send them a little email. Hey, do you want to talk? Are you okay? So, you know, you know, having such wonderful colleagues and, and friends is really important. And that's what I was about to say. Um, I, I find a lot of uh, a lot of comfort in finding solidarity among my community. Um, not even just the kidlet community, but just people in my neighborhood, my friends, talking about what's going on and knowing that people feel the same way as I do about it, and um, enlisting help when we need it. And I think the strength of community is is something that I'm really leaning into in these moments. It's funny, Leslie. A lot of people I know are banned. <laughs> So yeah. it's like we do, we do like, oh yeah, you, oh yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> dang. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, and then one thing that can really annoy is like someone will write a book that, oh, I hope it's going to be banned, that it helps book sales. And it's like, no, you don't. You really do not want that to happen. You want okay. your books to be out there and available for everybody without, you know, these people just saying horrible things about it. You don't want that. Trust me. One of my books, I have a small press, Reflection Press, and one of our books was banned and it impacted our press very, very intensely because we're so small. Yeah, so you it, do not want your book banned. It has a huge effect on small presses in particular. Yeah. Larger presses can weather it a little bit better, but smaller presses definitely have more at stake. That's, that's definitely true.